The Russian court has extended the pretrial detention of imprisoned American journalist Evan Gerskovich by three months. In response, his employer, the Wall Street Journal, released a statement yesterday confirming that he had appeared in a Moscow court while calling the charges against him demonstrably false. Gerskovich was taken into custody in March outside of a central Russian city on spying charges. Both the journal and U.S. officials have denied the accusation. The journal says U.S. embassy officials were able to attend yesterday's hearing, as well as Gerskovich's parents. It's unclear if anyone was able to speak with him. His pretrial detention is now set to run until the end of August. It comes after Moscow upheld his detention last month and after an appeal and after multiple U.S. embassy requests for consular access were denied this month. Gerskovich could face up to 20 years in prison if convicted. Joining us now, Democratic Congressman Alyssa Slotkin of Michigan. She's a former CIA analyst and also a candidate for U.S. Senate. And I want to talk to you about the uh, latest in Ukraine and the fighter jets headed their way, but also how this uh, situation with Gerskovich and others being held, U.S. citizens, the detention of American citizens in Russia. How much is that complicated by the U.S. support of Ukraine? Well, look, I mean, we know that Russia has long taken our version of political prisoners, you know, people who are used to hold um, some something over our heads. And we have this journalist, but also Paul Whelan, who's a Michigander who has been stuck, you know, in a similar situation in yeah. Russia for years now. Um, and this is, you know, in, in my mind, just a major distraction. Um, Russia trying to get the, the attention off of their significant losses in Ukraine, sort of their failure to succeed there and to get us talking about something else. And you know, it's working. Yeah. And then to the war in Ukraine and, and that sort of parallel um, situation, the decision to allow Ukrainian forces uh, to be trained um, by allies. Um, this is a dramatic change in uh, the approach toward how much we support Ukraine. What do you make of it? And do you expect uh, more support like this, more changes in just how much we escalate our support? Yeah, I think it's a really important decision. And there's been a bipartisan group of us that have been pushing for this first privately and then publicly um, with the administration. I think we have to just sort of reset on where we are in the war in Ukraine, right? Russia um, had mm -hmm. amazing ambitions there. They totally overplayed their hands. They've got pushback by some estimates have lost 100,000 people. And now they're celebrating the taking of a town that's smaller than Lansing, Michigan, you know, after months and months and a lot of casualties and taking it. So they're not succeeding there. But what we need to do is help the Ukrainians with a major significant push this summer punch Putin in the mouth a few more times, help change the status quo fundamentally so that the Ukrainians can decide um, when they can go to the negotiating table from a position of strength. They have to decide that. But for me, this summer is really important because we all know we can't go, you know, 10, 15 years providing the same level of assistance. Ukraine doesn't want to live like that for 10, 15 years. So for me, this summer is a really, really important moment of inflection. Congresswoman, good morning. I want to turn you to a different subject in your state of Michigan, and that is Governor Whitmer uh, signing this new red flag law. Uh, Michigan has put in a lot of work, Democrats, and, and with some Republican help, trying to put in some what meant most, if you look at polling, most Americans view as common sense ideas about safe storage and red flag laws and age limits and things like that. Um, how significant is this move and what progress do you see? I would note today is the anniversary, the tragic anniversary of the Uvalde shooting at Robb Elementary School. What are you seeing on the state level there in Michigan? Well, look, I mean, we had our second, you know, terrible school shooting back in February at Michigan State University. 15 months before that, we had Oxford High School. Both of them are places that I represented. And I, I think you have to understand that we sometimes get numb to these, you know, stories. But when you're personally affected, when it's your kid, your nephew, your spouse, it just changes you. And we saw that it, with the Michigan State shooting in particular, it really started to change sort of 
like, who was calling me and saying, like, look, you know, I'm a Republican. I am a, you know, serious gun owner. I'm a responsible gun owner, but I really want you to protect my babies in school. We started to see that change, and that's why we were able to do um, the significant gun laws um, that we've passed now three, um, uh, three separate times, um, culminating yesterday with red flag laws. So I, I think um, people change. They do evolve because they see our schools becoming war zones. And, and for me, I mean, Uvalde was a terrible moment. Um, and I will never forget a year ago today hearing about the attack. And then a year ago tomorrow, I had to get up in front of the Oxford High School Virtual Academy. So these are the students who never went back to school after their school shooting. They couldn't get back in a room in a public way um, after that shooting. They were so traumatized. And I had to stand in front of them. Many, many didn't show up to their own graduation because they were scared again and re-traumatized to come back in a big group. And I had to explain how after yet another school shooting, nothing had changed. So in Michigan, we're really changing the story. And I give our legislators a ton of credit.